It is my great privilege to really uh, offer up a trio of uh, outstanding speakers who are going to end today's symposium. It's uh, been a delight. Um, please stick around. There'll be opportunities to chat. We're having a wine and cheese reception at the end of today's talks. Um, I'm going to allow Dr. Moss the privilege of really introducing the three speakers, and I'd just like to take a few seconds to introduce uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Rick Moss. Uh, Rick uh, is um, Professor Emeritus at Stanford, and Rick has uh, been at Stanford really since um, the late 70s, and uh, he has um, shepherded the pulmonary program through uh, decades of growth, and in the course of doing, he, he has really created a culture of collaboration and a culture of kindness, where Rick has got the incredible ability of always finding the best part in any question, the best part in any person, and the best part in any bit of science that's presented to him. And Rick has been an incredible, uh, kind, and gracious uh, mentor to me since I've been here. And uh, it is also important to recognize that Rick has got a lot of time in rank here at Stanford. And he really was perhaps the first person uh, to look at the long-term follow-up of children with BPD. And he published a paper in 1991 uh, looking at the original cohort of patients who had BPD that were, uh, some of whom were described uh, shortly after 1967 by Dr. Northway. It was a powerfully important paper, and uh, that keeps with the theme of this very, very thin phenotyping and being able to look at the longitudinal physiologic effects of some of the clinical interventions that we undertake. Rick's uh, had a great career here, and he continues to. He's been uh, active in the lab. Uh, he's one of the world's experts in allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis and fungal diseases of the lungs, and uh, has been a huge contributor to the field of cystic fibrosis over the last many decades. Rick, thank you. Thank you, David, for that embarrassingly kind introduction. Um, and we're reflecting back on the BPD that, uh, that I was uh, working with Bill Northway on in the late 80s was uh, a disease uh, that's largely disappeared, although as Mike Tracy will tell you, it still exists, a disease of uh, later prematurity, larger infants, and less sophisticated medical care. Uh, what we see now is something different that a lot of people have called it the new BPD, and that's really largely what we'll be focusing on, which represents a disease of more immature uh, babies and um, a different pathophysiology. And hopefully, uh, we'll be enlightened by our talks today on, in particular, the, the role of angiogenesis and vascular component and pulmonary hypertension in this uh, new BPD. So the first talk is from uh, Christina Alvira, who is in the uh, Division of Critical Care Medicine here at Stanford. She's an associate professor and a mortgage uh, scholar in our Children's Health Research Institute. Uh, Christina had her undergraduate and medical education at Tufts University in Boston and then came westward, uh, as I did from the East Coast, and landed here at Stanford. Um, she did some postdoctoral training with Marlene Rabinowitz and uh, is interested in primarily late uh, gestational and early postnatal lung development with an emphasis on the relationship between vascular and alveolar uh, development, injury, and repair. So without further ado, Christina. Thank you so much for that um, introduction and the opportunity to uh, speak a little bit about our work. Um, as Dr. Deutsch already really highlighted earlier this afternoon, I think it's important to recognize that a significant component of lung development occurs not just during late pregnancy, but after birth as well. And it's during this final stage of development, um, during alveolarization, where you have division of those primitive terminal saccules into millions of tiny alveoli by the process of secondary septation that results in a dramatic increase in the gas exchange surface area of the lung. 
However, the immaturity of the lung during late pregnancy and after birth really renders it highly susceptible to injuries that can disrupt this developmental program. Um, and this really includes a lot of things that I encounter as a pediatric intensive care physician working with patients in the ICU. Um, factors such as mechanical ventilation, high levels of oxygen, severe lung infections and systemic infections um, that are potent disruptors of the process of alveolarization. And injuries that occur well before alveolarization even begins, such as intrauterine infections or intrauterine growth restriction of the fetus can also disrupt alveolarization. And I think much of what we know about how alveolarization occurs has really been learned by studying the impaired alveolar development that we see in babies born prematurely who develop um, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So the vasculature is really, I think, front and center of this process. And the role of pulmonary angiogenesis in promoting alveolarization, or the so-called vascular hypothesis, for distal lung growth was really, I think, pioneered in large part by the work um, done by Steve Abman, who's here, as well as Bernard Thibault and others. And it was really based on the observation that in the lungs of babies who died from bronchopulmonary dysplasia, there was an overall reduction in angiogenic factors, as well as um, dysmorphic um, development of the vasculature. And in animal models, if you directly block pulmonary angiogenesis, you disrupt alveolarization, inducing the larger and fewer alveoli that we call now alveolar simplification. And in those same animal models, if you use therapeutic or genetic ways in which you can promote angiogenesis, you can either preserve or restore alveolarization in times of injury. Now, although data really suggests that this period of alveolarization is likely to continue for a much longer period of postnatal life than we previously recognized, perhaps um, up to through the first decade in humans and through the first uh, two months or so in, in rodent models, really the majority of the alveoli are formed early in this period of bulk alveolarization, which again in humans is probably during the first two years and in animals probably the first two to three weeks. And concurrently, um, you have rapid expansion of the pulmonary capillary network during this period of um, uh, active angiogenesis. However, as the new alveolar septa begin to mature, um, the vasculature really switches from a phase of active growth um, to a phase of microvascular maturation or remodeling. And again, this happens in rodent models, we think, starting around postnatal day 14, and in humans somewhere around the first two years of life, although there's likely a lot of overlap. And as I mentioned, it's really during this time that the vasculature really switches from this uh, phase of growth to one of remodeling. And as you can see here, in a microvascular cast taken from a rat at postnatal day four, and this is in rodents, the beginning of alveolarization, you have this characteristic double capillary layer, um, which is lining the alveolar septa. And this fuses to form the single capillary layer that's characteristic of the adult lung, as you can see here in this microvascular cast from a rat at postnatal day 44. And I think although it's fairly well accepted now that the pulmonary growth of the pulmonary vascular bed is driving alveolarization, I think what we're not completely clear about is whether um, the induction or this pulmonary vascular remodeling phase is a normal physiologic me uh, mechanism that helps to slow alveolar growth. But what we have seen is that there are some injuries um, that are known to disrupt alveolarization. For example, postnatal dexamethasone treatment, um, which is shown here, that are associated with a premature fusion of this double capillary layer weeks earlier than you would normally um, expect to see it. And this really um, raised the question that perhaps um, both understanding the mechanisms that control pulmonary vascular growth and those that induce remodeling might be important in understanding alveolarization. And we became very interested in trying to understand the mechanisms that are uh, controlling the angiogenic capacity of the pulmonary endothelial cells during lung development. So to begin to tackle this question, we developed a method where we could isolate primary pulmonary endothelial cells from mice at different stages of lung development. And as I mentioned earlier, mice actually um, are a somewhat convenient, I think, animal model to study lung development because 
Um, at postnatal day one, they're actually born in the saccular stage of development and only begin alveolarization at uh, postnatal day uh, four. So we started these studies by comparing the uh, behavior of pulmonary endothelial cells taken from mice during that early alveolarization or bulk alveolarization phase with um, pulmonary endothelial cells from adult mice. And we initially focused on uh, processes that we thought were important in angiogenesis, so survival of the endothelial cells, proliferation, migration. And as you can see here, um, the two groups of cells actually acted quite differently. So the early alveolar uh, pulmonary endothelial cells here with the yellow bars survived or were much more resistant to apoptosis than the adult cells. They proliferated more quickly, and they also migrated faster than the adult endothelial cells. And we became very interested and focused on one specific signaling pathway that we think is very important in driving this proangiogenic phenotype of the early alveolar pulmonary endothelial cells. And this signaling pathway is the uh, NF-kappa B signaling pathway. And this is a pathway, it's a transcription, family of transcription factors that is really expressed and present in all cells. But these NF-kappa B complexes, which you can see here, are uh, present in the cytoplasm in an inactive state. And it's only after activation by a complex of kinases that you can see here, where an inhibitory protein is degraded and this allows these transcription factors to translocate into the nucleus where they can very quickly regulate gene expression. And so this, because the key regulatory step of activation is movement from these molecules from the cytoplasm to the nucleus, this gave us a relatively easy way to get an assessment of how much activation of the pathway was present in the lung um, by doing immunofluorescent staining to look for the presence of these NF-kappa B complexes in the nucleus. And when we did that, we found that in the early alveolar lung, we saw a lot of nuclear staining for NF-kappa B molecules. Um, which you can see here by the combination of the pink um, immunofluorescent staining from the NF-kappa B molecule on top of the blue nucleus, making this purple signal. Whereas in the adult mouse lung, really most of the NF-kappa B was in the cytoplasm, so in the inactive state. And when we used a similar method to get a sense of how much NF-kappa B activation was present in primary pulmonary endothelial cells taken from different stages in development, we also saw that there seemed to be a dynamic pattern with really peak activation of active NF-kappa B at this early alveolar stage of development and really little activation um, in the pulmonary endothelium um, in the adult. And we went on to show that this pathway was important for in lung development in two ways. Um, first, in very early proof of concept experiments, we treated the mice at, just at the beginning of alveolarization with a very potent irreversible inhibitor of the NF-kappa B activating kinases called Bay 117082. And what we found that this was actually a very potent stimuli to impair alveolarization. And you can see the alveolar simplification um, that was observed in the mice just 24 hours after this treatment. Interestingly, we did the same experiment in adult mice, and this had absolutely no effect on the adult lung structure, again, consistent with the idea that this pathway was not active in the adult lung. And you can see that this impaired alveolarization was actually quite durable, and the mice that actually survived, um, they, if you looked at their lungs seven, hour, seven days later, um, there was really minimal recovery or growth of, of the distal lung in that time point. And then more recently, over the past um, couple of years, we've worked really hard to um, create an uh, endothelial specific uh, deletion of one of the main NF-kappa B activators, IKK beta, that um, we can induce at key stages in, t in, in lung development. And um, that's uh, uh, these PDGF inducible Cre IKK beta floxed mice. And what we found was that in the mice um, where we induced deletion of IKK beta um, a few days before alveolarization occurs, that that in and of itself is sufficient to induce this alveolar simplification. And moreover, that those um, endothelial-specific IKK beta null mice have a more exaggerated phenotype when placed in um, chronic hyperoxia. And this really uh, represented the first definitive genetic evidence for the importance of this pathway in the endothelial cells at this uh, key time point in development. So once we had that data, we really became interested in trying to understand, well, how is it that this pathway is specifically activated at this time point in vascular development? And then again, a little bit later, when the, when the vasculature matures, that this pathway becomes quiescent. And initially, we thought there must be something 
that was intrinsically different between the two groups of cells in terms of the regulation of the pathway. We did a lot of studies comparing the um, early alveolar and the adult pulmonary endothelial cells looking for expression and regulation of the inhibitors and activators of the pathway and really f didn't find a lot of differences. So then we thought, well, maybe it's that the cells themselves aren't really that different, but it's more it's the environment. It's what the cells are seeing at the early alveolar stage that's activating the pathway in one context and then later in development, maintaining the pathway quiescent. So we thought, well, maybe we can see if there, um, things that are being secreted or produced by the early alveolar lung are actually able to activate the pathway in the adult pulmonary endothelial cells. So we created an organ culture model where we took the lungs and maintained them ex vivo for 24 hours and created the, cre uh, collected the secreted factors of the lung conditioned media, um, which we then added to the adult endothelial cells, as you can see here, where and did immunofluorescent staining again to get, look for nuclear NF-kappa B um, as, a, as a readout of activity. And what we found was that secreted factors from the early alveolar lung really could potently activate this pathway in the adult cells. Whereas secreted factors that we obtained from uh, lung at a little bit later in development, a time period when we were past the early active angiogenic phase and more in the microvascular maturation phase, which we'll call sort of mid-alveolar, actually only had a, a, a sort of mild effect. And we had no effect when we uh, took secreted factors that were collected from the adult lung. And I think more importantly, these early alveolar secreted factors also um, were able to change the angiogenic phenotype of the cells. And so this was looking at endothelial migration via scratch assay, where we're measuring how much of a, an, a, a scratch in the endothelial monolayer is closed by migrating cells. And as you can see, the early alveolar lung condition media was as good as 5% serum in actually inducing these adult pulmonary endothelial cells to move. And again, secreted factors from the adult lung condition media had a very minimal effect. So after we had these data, then, of course, we wanted to know well, what is in it, what's in those secreted factors that is uh, promoting this angiogenic phenotype. So um, we did a proteomic study um, doing, using 2D DEEJ to really uh, uh, two-dimensional uh, uh, gel uh, differential gel electrophoresis. And we took the secretomes of the early alveolar lung, the mid-alveolar or sort of late alveolar lung, where we had sort of the mild effect, and the adult. And we were able to then label each of the secretomes with this separate fluorochromes and then run all the proteins on one gel. And then what you're seeing here is any two secretomes compared against one another in these three images. And so what we decided to do was first to only select proteins that were produced by both the early alveolar and the mid-alveolar secretome. So that corresponded to the red spots in those first two gels. But then they had to also be much more highly expressed in the early alveolar as compared to the late alveolar. So that corresponded to then either red or orange spots in that third image of the gel. And from those um, proteins, we identified the top 25 most differentially regulated by mass spec. And I'm going to tell you more about one of those 25 proteins that we found using this method. And that is this protein here, um, which is called transforming growth factor beta-induced protein. So not TGF-beta-1, but TGF-BI. Um, and as you can see from these higher magnification images of the gel, it's a protein that was um, highly expressed in the early alveolar lung secretome, but not expressed at all in the adult lung secretome, which corresponded to a red spot when you overlaid those two signals. So what is TGFBI? So it's an interesting protein. It's, it's known to be secreted. Uh, it's classically secreted. It's produced by fibroblasts, monocytes, endothelial cells, and it has um, a number of FAST domains in the protein, so it allows it to bind to the matrix, and it also has an RGD domain, so it can um, bind to integrins as well. And, um, just recently, and this is um, an image that actually Dr. Swar had in his talk. Um, this is class, uh, work from Jeff Witsit's group looking at uh, single cell profiling of uh, lung cells uh, postnatal day one. And this is the clustering just of the mesenchymal cells. And what you'll see here is um, that TGFBI was identified as a highly distinguishing gene that really discriminates or identifies myofibroblasts and vascular smooth muscle cells at this time point in development. <clears throat> 
About 20 years, almost 20 years earlier, there was a very small report where um, uh, they showed that TGFBI in the lungs of um, a human patient who was two years of age was very highly expressed uh, at the tips of the secondary crests, locations which are uh, uh, typically um, where myofibroblasts are typically found. And then interestingly work that was done here at Stanford by Hugh Obrodovich and Gary Shaw. Um, TGFBI, a rare variant in TGFBI, was actually one of 258 rare variants um, that was found to be associated with an increased risk of BPD. So there was a lot of evidence suggesting that this might be an important protein. So we first um, confirmed this uh, developmental expression of TGFBI um, in a number of ways. We did Western blots. Um, looking at the expression in separate cohorts of our lung conditioned media, as well as in um, lysates from whole lung. And in both, group, um, both studies, what we found was very high expression uh, during the early alveolar stage of development and really um, minimal expression, really no expression um, at P30 by um, sort of young adult. And then we did immunofluorescent staining as well, looking at the expression pattern of TGFBI and C2. And as you can see in the early alveolar lung, there were numerous cells that are really intensely positive for TGFBI, whereas in the adult lung, there's really no TGFBI expression. And consistent with what others have found, we found that many of these intensely positive staining cells were found at the tips of the secondary crests. We then wondered, well, how much of the pro-angiogenic effect of those early alveolar uh, secreted factors was really related to the presence of TGFBI? So we did studies where we added antibodies, anti-TGFBI neutralizing antibodies, to the lung conditioned media. And we were able to show that um, although the addition of isotype control antibodies to the lung conditioned media still allowed for the media to increase NF-kappa B activation in the adult pulmonary endothelial cells, the anti-TGFBI antibody blunted this effect. And moreover, when we did similar studies looking at the effect of the um, early alveolar lung conditioned media to promote migration, we found that the anti-TGFBI antibodies actually completely blocked the pro-migratory effect of the secreted factors. We then did studies where we wanted to see just the effect of recombinant TGFBI alone. Um, and to do these studies, we actually partnered with um, Sarah Heelshorn here at Stanford, and she created microfluidic chemotaxis assays for us. And in these assays, this allowed us to basically have a source um, on one side um, and a sink on the opposite side, which would then create a stable linear gradient uh, for TGFBI in the cell chamber. And then the cells were imaged by live video microscopy and individual cells tracked in order to create these directional histograms where the size of each wedge is proportional to the number of cells that are migrating within that angular tra trajectory. And so as you can see, um, with the negative control, which was our starvation media, the cells basically um, migrated randomly, although there was a slight drift to the left. Um, and this was in contrast to our positive control, um, which is VEGF, where you can see the cells had directed migration towards the source. And we found that both with the early alveolar lung conditioned media, as well as with just recombinant TGFBI alone, we saw the same uh, direct directed migration towards the source. We also were able to show that the uh, recombinant TGFBI alone um, is able to induce NF-kappa B activation in our cells. And we showed this both by um, the increased nuclear presence of NF-kappa B complexes on immunofluorescent staining, as well as increased NF-kappa B uh, binding, uh, DNA binding on EMSA from nuclear extracts um, obtained from cells that were stimulated with recombinant TGFBI. And moreover, that the um, TGFBI-mediated migration really seems to be dependent on its ability to activate NF-kappa B, because when we did these migration studies using our endothelial cells that we um, obtained from the mouse I told you about earlier with the endothelial-specific deletion of IKK-beta, that TGFBI was not able to induce migration um, in those cells. More recently, we've been trying to get a better understanding of what are the mechanisms really accounting for these effects. Um, so we uh, did RNA-seq on our early alveolar endothelial cells and our adult endothelial cells stimulated with TGFBI. And we'd had some 
Um, additional data that I didn't show you that um, demonstrated that TGFBI could actually promote migration in both the neonatal or the early alveolar and the adult. So what we were looking for was shared genes, genes that were upregulated in both groups in response to TGFBI. And in fact, there weren't actually a lot of shared genes, which in and of itself I think is very interesting. Um, but one gene that we found that was shared is CSF3. Um, which I think most of us are GCSF. Most of us think of mostly for its um, chemokine and uh, effects in, with leukocytes in the immune system. However, there were a number of reports demonstrating that CSF3 actually can enhance um, nitric oxide synthase activation and NO production and promote migration in other types of endothelial cells. So we first confirmed that TGFBI was able to um, increase CSF3 um, gene expression. And we did studies where we actually looked for NO production by using an NO sensitive dye that fluoresces green um, in response to NO production. Um, and we were able to show that recombinant TGFBI enhances nitric oxide production in our endothelial cells. And we did studies to see how much of this effect was really related to CSF3 by silencing CSF3 um, with siRNA. And as you can see, we got really nice knockdown of the protein by 48 hours, which is when we did our functional studies. And we were able to show that silencing of CSF3 both impaired the ability of recombinant TGFBI to induce cell migration as well as um, really completely blocking the ability of recombinant TGFBI to enhance NO production in our cells. And we've also done studies um, in collaboration with Simon Conway's group to try and get, again, more definitive um, evidence that this uh, protein is important for promoting alveolar and vascular growth by studying the phenotype of mice uh, that um, lack TGFBI. And um, what we found is that baseline for these TGFB all null mice, they had this uh, mild alveolar simplification um, that really was associated with an overall decrease in the number of uh, distal vessels when we were looking at um, the number of von Willebrand factor stained vessels, which is a gross measure of pulmonary vascular density. And these mice really have a much more severe phenotype when they're exposed to chronic hyperoxia. As you can see, they developed really marked um, airspace dilation, alveolar simplification, and a real loss of distal vessels. And finally, I think we are starting to have some evidence as well that alterations in this lung microenvironment in response to injury may be playing a key role um, in the pathogenesis of the impaired alveolarization and angiogenesis that we see. Um, so in these experiments, we basically repeated the organ culture experiments, but instead of um, looking at different times in development, we took the early alveolar lung and we maintained it either in normoxia or in increasing um, amounts of hyperoxia. And what we found was oxygen exposure um, resulted in a dose-dependent decrease in the ability of these secreted factors to induce um, endothelial migration. Um, and this was associated, if you look at the conditioned media that was uh, created with 75% oxygen exposure, um, a significant reduction in TGFBI protein present within that lung conditioned media. And we didn't see that when we um, created the conditioned media uh, by maintaining the organ culture and hypoxia. And these are very preliminary studies, um, but we started a, a recent collaboration um, with Mary Sunday, um, who spent years um, working on a premature baboon model of BPD. And these are early kind of proof of concept studies where we first just tested her control and her most severe injury, which is mechanical ventilation plus it's supposed to be 100% oxygen there. I um, mean, as you can see, there's um, in the control animals, we see a lot of individual cells that are intensely positive for TGFBI. And in, in addition to the, I think, very dramatic marked uh, septal thickening, you can see just a dramatic decrease in TGFBI immunostaining in her um, old BPD samples. So to summarize, you, we um, believe that uh, developmental expression of these factors in the lung um, microenvironment are really key to activating this proangiogenic pathway in the early alveolar uh, pulmonary uh, endothelium and that with maturation, loss of these factors and perhaps the induction of additional developmental factors maintain uh, NF-kappa B inactive and maintain 
uh, endothelial quiescence. But with injury, we feel like this balance is disrupted and you can potentially get both loss of those important developmental factors or perhaps even induction of the normal maturation response too early. And this inactivates uh, this proangiogenic pathway and, and impairs angiogenesis. And because alveolarization continues through many years postnatally, we think that um, having a better granular understanding or more granular understanding of these alterations in the lung microenvironment might allow us to really use this knowledge to create new therapies, not just to enhance lung growth in premature babies, but perhaps, uh, perhaps also um, either help preserve lung development in older children or even enhance lung repair in the setting of acute injury. And we're very interested in comparing and contrasting the response of the immature and the mature lung to injury, both to identify factors that should be expressed in development that are lost in response to injury, as these may represent additional proangiogenic factors, but also to really identify if there are factors that are normally just expressed in the adult lung that get prematurely induced with injury, as these may represent induction of developmentally regulated and anti-angiogenic factors. So with that, I will end um, with a thank you, of course, to um, everyone who um, really made this work possible. I want to highlight Min Liu here, who's a research associate in my lab, who's done a lot of the mechanistic work on TGFBI. Shayla Javrao made the endothelial specific knockout mouse, and Christiana Iosef, who was at University of Reno, Nevada, but just came back to Stanford. Um, she did a lot of the early work on the proteomic analysis, and of course, all of our collaborators, funding sources. I had wonderful mentorship by Marlene. Um, and all of our funding sources, including the um, MCHRI. Thanks very much. Yeah. Right. So I think that's something that we're very interested in in studying. We know we can do it in the cells. Uh, we don't know whether we can do it in the lung, and it's a question, too, of whether I think we're interested both in activating, so for example, treating with TGFBI or overexpressing TGFBI and seeing the TGFBI mediated effects, as well as just activating the NF kappa B pathway. The endothelial activation of the NF kappa B pathway is something we're working on because there's a genetic model that makes that pretty easy. The TGFBI treatment, I think we'd have to think about what the right model is. I like the pneumonectomy idea, um, because I think that it's clear that TGFBI activates NF-kappa B, but I think it probably does a lot of other things as well. And if you notice, the phenotype of that mouse is actually worse than our endothelial-specific NF-kappa B knockout. So I think both experiments would be interesting. Would you want to share the 22 proteins uh, that you found that uh, were available to you in the lab? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, we picked this one because it had the most Basis, but there's another one that we found that I think I talked to you about before. We didn't know what to do with it. I'm still very interested in, but yeah, of course, happy to collaborate with with anyone on anything. Yeah.